Now, as we come today, friends, to the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we have here the record of the birth of the Lord Jesus. Now, you'll recall that when we began this study, I made certain statements. And one of the statements was that this gospel has a twofold purpose. It's a historical record, and you're going to note that in this chapter in a very definite way. It was written, actually, for the Greek, directed to him in particular. And for that reason, it was written to the thinking man. And it also has a great spiritual purpose and that's to present the Son of God. And so today we have an opportunity to look at that in a very definite way. And I promise to give you a quotation or two along this line to back up these statements. I want to go back and quote from Neander, one of the great saints of the past. And he made this statement, and I'm quoting now, "...the three great historical nations had to contribute, each in its own peculiar way, to prepare the soil for the planting of Christianity. The Jews on the side of the religious element, the Greeks on the side of science and art, the Romans as masters of the world on the side of the political element. So that we've seen in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke that each one of these gospels were directed to a particular segment of humanity, of the human race. Matthew to the Jew, Mark to the Roman, and now Luke to the Greek. And again, it is Dr. Gregory who wrote, the Greeks are clearly distinguished from the other great historic races by certain marked characteristics. They were the representatives of reason and humanity in the ancient world. They looked upon themselves as having the mission of perfecting man. They were the cosmopolites of that age. They made their gods in the likeness of man, in their own likeness, and therefore joined to human culture utter worldliness and godlessness. And they had, you remember that altar, to an unknown god that Paul called their attention to. Paul was the proper one to go there to Athens and go into Greece and preach this gospel that Luke had written about here in this gospel. And, of course, Dr. Luke was along with him. Dr. Luke, evidently a Gentile. Now, there is something else that probably we should say concerning. The Greek mission was thus evidently a part of the preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus into the world. It forced the thinking man of that age to feel and confess the insufficiency of human reason, even in its most perfect development, for the deliverance and perfection of mankind, and it left them waiting and longing for one who could accomplish this work. Now, Dr. Luke is getting ready, beginning here with chapter 2, having given us this preface and this introduction to present the Lord Jesus from his birth to his death to his resurrection and to the ascension back into heaven and the promise of his coming again. Dr. Luke covers a great deal of ground for us that's important. Actually, the thing that the Greek accomplished was to give a language that became the vehicle for getting the word out. It communicated the gospel to the world was the Greek language. And God used that man, Alexander the Great, to do that. And Housen says of Alexander, he says he took up the meshes of the net of civilization, which were lying in disorder on the edges of the Asiatic shore, and spread them over all the countries which he traversed in his wonderful campaigns. The East and West were suddenly brought together. Separated tribes were united under a common government. New cities were built as the centers of political life. New lines of communication were opened as the channels of commercial activity. The new culture penetrated the mountainous ranges of Pisidia and Lacaonia. The Tigris and Euphrates 
became Greek rivers. The language of Athens was heard among the Jewish colonists of Babylonia. And a Grecian Babylon was built by the conqueror in Egypt and called by his name. And, of course, that was Alexandria, a great city in Egypt then and even down to the present day. Now we find, with that kind of a background, we should look now at the birth of the Lord Jesus. And notice these things we've mentioned, that this man sticks close to history. And Sir William Ramsey found out he was very accurate in every statement he made. I'm reading now Luke 2, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, somebody says, gracious, were they taxing America in those days? No, my friend, but it says all the world. But the interesting word that is used here is the Greek word oikumene. It means inhabited earth, and it means the civilized world of that day. And you know, we weren't civilized in those days. Most of us had ancestors in northern Europe, and they weren't even included in this, although Caesar Augustus would love to tax everybody if he could have got to them, and he would have. Now, who is this man, Caesar Augustus? Well, he was an adopted son of Julius Caesar. His name actually was Octavius. And he took the name Caesar. I think he had a right to it, and it was a name that was sort of like the name Cadillac. It had prestige, and he took that name. Now, Augustus was not a name at all, but a title. When the Senate submitted to him certain titles, one, by the way, was king, and another emperor, and another was dictator, and he didn't like that term. But he took the name or the title of Augustus. Now, you'll notice that Augustus has a religious significance with it. He attempted to deify himself and make himself God. And here is a man, and I think this is remarkable, and Dr. Luke didn't say this accidentally. Caesar Augustus, he signed the tax bill, and he said the whole world in that day must be taxed. And he said that this is the thing that's got to take place. I need money to raise my army and keep my army in the field. I need money to live in luxury. And so he made this decree that the world should be taxed. And notice now, this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Notice that historical reference? And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Now, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And friends, you couldn't say it any better than that. He came out of Galilee. The town was Nazareth. He went into Judea, was the city of David, and it's called Bethlehem. And the reason he did all of this was because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary. Why did she have to go to Bethlehem? Because she happens to be of the lineage of David also. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now, this is, to me, may I say, the thrill I get as I read this simple historical statement that is historically accurate, but back of it is a great spiritual truth. Here is a man who attempted to make himself God. He signed a tax bill that everything should be taxed in his day. And he wanted to be worshipped, by the way. Well, it caused a woman and a man living in Nazareth, peasants, if you please, and they went down to Bethlehem to enroll. And that woman was carrying the Son of God. My friend, you want to read that statement again? Read this record? It's tremendous. Caesar Augustus tried to make himself God. Nobody's paying taxes to him today, and nobody reverences him today at all. They've practically forgotten about Caesar Augustus. But may I say that that little baby that was in the womb of Mary 
There are a lot of us today worship Him. A great many of us that call Him our Savior today. I don't know about you, but this is a remarkable story to me. And notice what happened when she was down there, and she shouldn't have been going down there. I feel like saying, wait a minute, Caesar, Augustus. Remember that there are women that are with child are going to have to be moved to get your taxes. And I think he'd have said, I don't care about babies. I'm interested in armies and taxes and money and luxury. And all that's gone now. And we're told here, so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. This is all arranged to God. It was in the fullness of time that God sent forth his son so he could be born in Bethlehem. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, friends, are you willing now to face up to it? Dr. Luke gets right down to the nitty-gritty, and he tells you exactly how it was. I like the way he does it. You know what he's saying to you here? He says that Mary put diapers on God. Do you like that? May I say to you, this is a tremendous statement. This little baby that she put swaddling clothes on him, He's the Son of God. This is a tremendous statement, and I'm not through. Notice verse 8. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Couldn't have been the dead of winter, or they wouldn't have been out there with those sheep at night. Someone says, when do you think he was really born? I don't want to go into that question, because to me it's irrelevant, because he was born period, just like what day was he crucified on, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And someone tried to get an argument with me by mail some time ago, and I told him that it doesn't say Christ died for our sins on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. He just died for our sins. And that's the thing that's important. And the thing's important here, he was born. And I think it was the springtime. But be that as it may, I'm not prepared to even argue that. I don't care to even defend it. I just don't think it was the dead of winter. And I think that's irrelevant, the date that he was born. The important thing is he was born. That's the great fact. Now, we are told here that there were shepherds there with their flocks in the field. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I said a moment ago that Mary put diapers on God. (laughs) That's what she did. That's what Dr. Luke, he's a doctor, he's trying to tell you that, friends. Don't miss the point. It's a tremendous statement. For under you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, that says a whole lot to me. I have refrained now for months to say something to you folks that you'll have to admit when you hear it that I've exercised a great deal of self-restraint. I have a grandson that if I had an hour and a half on the radio, I'd tell you about him because he's pretty wonderful. I heard the story about two men talking to each other. One of them said to the other, have I told you about my grandson and showed you pictures of him? And the other man said, no, you haven't, and I want to thank you for it. So... I won't tell you folks about him other than to say it's wonderful to see a little fella like this to come into the world and you have your heart goes out to him and there's a sympathy that goes from you to him. And you know that's the way God entered the world. He could have come in as he's going to come the second time in power and great glory. But he came in the weakest way you can come into this world. He came, as George MacDonald put it, he came a little baby thing that made a woman cry. Or, if you want the rest of it, 
They were looking for a king to lift them high. But he came a little baby thing that made a woman cry. That's the way that he came into this world, a savior of the world. And he laid aside not his deity, but his glory, because there should have been more than just a few shepherds there and these angels. All of creation should have been there. That fellow, Caesar Augustus, instead of collecting taxes, should have been over there to worship him. And he could have forced him to, but he didn't, you see. He did lay aside not his deity, but his prerogatives of deity. And he came the little baby thing. This is the picture that's here, and I can't think of anything lovelier than we have here. And let me read on. This shall be the sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Mary put diapers on him, friends. That's what Dr. Luke's telling you. He came into this world a human being. He's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows you today, and he knows me today. And it also means I can know something about God, too, because he took upon himself our humanity. And verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. Now, let's don't misquote that. And this is not the thing really that the angels said. It's not on earth peace, goodwill toward men, but it's peace to man of goodwill. This is not this asinine statement that's being made today. Let's have peace, 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 peace. My friend, God says, there is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. And he says, we live in a day when you need to be beating your plowshares into sowards, not the other way around. We live in a wicked world. We live in a world where Satan dominates it. And because of that, there's no peace in the world. But there is peace to men of goodwill. If you're one of those that have come to Christ, taken him as Savior, you can know the peace of God being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of peace he came to bring the first time. Now he's coming the second time as the Prince of Peace, and he's going to put down unrighteousness and the rebellion in the world. And he'll establish peace on the earth. And until he comes, there'll be no peace on this earth. Now I'm reading verse 15. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, let us now go unto Bethlehem. See this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they made haste. They came to Bethlehem, they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, they got there early, but as I said when we were in Matthew, the wise men did not get there until much later. He was in a house when they got there, and I'm of the opinion that if several months had elapsed. Now, will you notice, when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. That's the way a mother would do, as you know. And she was a wonderful mother. Verse 20, And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And then you will recall Mary and Joseph went down into Egypt. Then they came back to Nazareth, and there was nothing that took place until he was 30 years of age. That is, he didn't begin his ministry until then. But now we have here the fact that he's become a man. And since he has, he was born under the law, and he's going to follow the law. When eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, the name was called Jesus which was so named to the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And you remember there were 32 days. That meant that there were 40 days that the woman was declared unclean because she'd brought a sinner into the world. Mary was a sinner. You see, she needed a Savior, as she said. 
And all this was done as it was written in the law of the Lord. We saw that in Leviticus when we were studying it a few weeks ago. Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And as we said at that time, they offered the turtle doves, which is an evidence of their poverty. And they did this according to the law because of the fact that the sacrifice was for Mary and not for him. As far as we know, he never offered a sacrifice. Now there was there a man by the name of Simeon. And we read in verse 25, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And what happened? Well, he came by the Spirit into the temple, and the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. And here's another solo we have here. This man Simeon singing it for us, and it's the nunc dementis. Now let thy servant depart in peace. Why? For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And I want to stop on that expression. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. What did he see? A little baby. That's all he saw. You see, salvation is a person, friend. Salvation is not something you do. Salvation is a person, and that person is Christ. You either have him or you don't have him. You either trust him or you don't trust him. Simeon, who was there in the temple... He had been promised he'd see the salvation of God. And he says, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. That's verse 30. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. This is a remarkable statement coming from a man that we would say that he was limited in his outlook on life. Certainly, he would be limited to that particular area geographically. And yet he is looking at one who is to be the Savior for all the world. This, to me, is one of the amazing things about the Word of God, although given to a certain people, especially the New Testament, it's certainly directed to the world. And no other religion pointed that way. You will notice the religions of the world are generally localized for a peculiar people. Uh, generally a race or a nation. That has been true of Shintoism, Buddhism, Mohammedanism. But Christianity has been for all people. This is a remarkable statement in light of that. It says, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And the salvation was a person, as we've indicated, and that person is Christ. Now, this was an amazing statement, and the reaction of Joseph and his mother are amazing. And you notice it doesn't say his father and his mother. It says, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, the child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary paid a tremendous price to bring the Savior into the world. It was an awful price, to tell the truth, to have to stand beneath the cross of the Lord Jesus and see him die. The cross of Christ has moved many people. Artists have painted the picture. Songwriters have sung about it. Preachers have talked about it. And there's a danger of dwelling on the sympathy angle because he didn't die to elicit anyone's sympathy. He doesn't want your sympathy. Right here in Luke, he'll tell the women who are weeping, "'Weep not for me.'" 
weep for yourselves. If you have tears for Jesus, save them and save them for yourself, not for him. He doesn't want your sympathy. He wants your faith. But the amazing thing here is that his mother paid that tremendous price. She stood beneath the cross and looked up at him. It was not sympathy. It was a broken heart. And that's when this was fulfilled. Yet a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And for him to become the Savior of the world, it was necessary actually for her to have to endure this. Now, don't misunderstand me. Her suffering has nothing in the world to do with your salvation. And her suffering had nothing in the world to do with her salvation. But it had something to do with bringing him into the world, raising him. He was her son. You see, when our Lord looked down at him, he said to her, he says, Woman, behold thy son. And there was a human relationship there that no one else had at all. And she's suffering in that particular connection. Now you have another one here. My, we've got a lot of solos here. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age. By the way, I can't refrain from saying this. There are those that say the ten lost tribes are ten lost tribes. If you go through the Bible from the time they returned after the captivity, you can pick up practically all the tribes. Here's the tribe of Asher. Evidently, Anna didn't get lost. She was of the tribe of Asher, and that's supposed to be one of the ten lost tribes. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years. I don't think she'd been a widow that long. She's 84 years old, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And she gave thanks. I don't have her song here. I don't have the music, but she sang here as you can see. Now we're told, and Dr. Luke just passes over what Matthew tells us about going down into Egypt. Because you see, the coming of the wise men does not fit into Luke's gospel. You say, why? Well, who was it that the wise men came to see? The ideal of the Greek race? Of course not. They came, and their question made it clear. Where is he, this born king? We're looking for a king. Matthew presents him as the king. Dr. Luke presents him as the perfect man. And notice how he'll carry out his purpose even at this point. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Now, he entirely omits the fact that they went down into Egypt. Does that mean they didn't go down into Egypt? No, it just means that Dr. Luke is writing for a purpose, Matthew writing for a purpose. And if you just let these writers alone and let them tell what they want to tell you and listen to them, you'll learn a great deal more than listening to the critics, I can assure you. Now, will you notice verse 40? And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Who is Luke presenting? The perfect man. Dr. Luke would naturally want to look at the boy. He was not only the obstetrician, he's the pediatrician here. And he says the child grew, and he waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. How did he grow? Will you notice? He grew physically. He waxed strong in spirit, spiritually, filled with wisdom, mentally. He grew mentally, spiritually, and physically. And the grace of God was upon him. That's the story of Luke. Now we have here an incident that only Dr. Luke records. And why does he record it? Because of the fact that he alone is the pediatrician that's going to lift out of the life of the Lord Jesus one incident when he was 12 years old. We have no other record 
from the time he was born till the time he began his ministry. We call those the silent years. Now, I do not, frankly, consider them silent years. I have a little book entitled, The Silent Years in the Life of Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not offering it now on the program, but you could order it if you wanted it. And I fill those silent years up, friends. I think they're filled in the Scripture if you just look for where it is. And here is one incident, of course. Now, it's the incident of when they went up to Jerusalem. And when they went up to Jerusalem, here is the record, verse 41. Now his parents went up to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Now, Dr. Luke is saying they went up every year, but here's one incident I want to tell you about that took place when he was 12 years old. Now, I'm sure we're all familiar with this, and especially you've seen Hoffman's picture of Christ among these learned doctors up there. When they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. You see, they're raising him as a normal child. He didn't run around, friends, with a halo on. My, these middle-aged artists got some very funny conceptions of our Lord Jesus, both as a baby, as a boy, and then as a full-grown adult. I don't think he looked like any of them, to tell the truth. And he just grew up as a normal boy. You see, they went up to Jerusalem in companies. And there's a little town right north of Jerusalem. That's where they missed him. And that's where all these families that came from the north, well, they got together there and they came into Jerusalem for the feast days. And when they left Jerusalem, why, all the families are getting together and they meet up there at that place. Then they start out. And lo and behold, Joseph says, where's Jesus? Mary says, well, I thought he was with you. And he said, no, I thought he was with you. And they began to look, and they missed him. And so they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. And when they got back there, where do you suppose they found him? Well, they found him in the temple, and they found him there right in the midst of them, both hearing them and asking them questions. And he was asking them questions that they couldn't answer. Verse 47, all they that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. He had the answer, apparently. Now, they made it very clear. I think they were a little provoked, actually. His mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, notice his answer to him. How is it that ye sought me? Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? And his father's business, and I think this is interesting here. If Joseph was the father, he could have stepped up. He said, well, what are you trying to do? Get some carpenter work here in Jerusalem? But my friend, he never did carpenter work in Jerusalem. He did carpenter work up in Nazareth. And he's not looking for that. His father's business is his heavenly father. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And let's notice that. They didn't understand it. Mary, at this point, did not appreciate exactly who he was and what he's to do. She's pondered these things in her heart. Now, verse 51, "...and he went down with them and came to Nazareth. He was subject unto them." And I think that's quite interesting in this day when even 12-year-olds today are demanding to be heard. I get a little weary, don't you, if they tell us today that the college students have something to say and we ought to listen to them. I've listened to them. They're certainly giving them plenty of publicity on radio and TV, and I haven't heard them say anything yet. I personally don't think a college student has much to say. That is, I feel like he's green back of the ears. And I don't care what his IQ is. That's nothing. I know men with PhDs and a high IQ And they don't have sense enough to get in out of the rain. And I can prove that because I moved with that crowd when I was teaching. And friends, there are a lot of dumb PhDs. And the important thing here is that the Lord Jesus was subject to his parents. He was subject to them. And this is an amazing thing. And his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Now, the important thing that I want you to notice is verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature 
and in favor with God and man. Would you like to have Dr. Luke's report about the boy Jesus and those silent years? Here it is. He increased. He grew in wisdom, and he grew in stature, and he grew in favor with God and man. He grew physically, he grew mentally, and he grew spiritually. On all three levels, why he's growing. That is the picture that's given of him here. Now, chapter 3, we have the ministry of John the Baptist, and I'll probably get down through this section here. Now, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. And believe me, we have a whole lot of detail given to us here. The fact of the matter is, Luke is a stickler for accuracy, you see. Six characters are identified here to give the time. You could be able to date this. There is a message in these names and point of history. Caesar Augustus was emperor when the Lord Jesus was born. And now Tiberius Caesar was emperor. Profane history will have to supply us with the data. Tiberius Caesar was brilliant, but he was brutal. He was clever, but cunning. He was inhuman and profane. He attempted world mastery. Then the puppets are given, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. Why too? Well, that reveals the power of Rome over the religion of Jerusalem in that day. The fact of the matter is, old Annas was the power back of the throne, but Caiaphas was the one that Rome put out in front. And the normal experience of John would have been for him to have been serving in the temple in some capacity under such leadership. But he despised it. He went to the wilderness. He renounced his priesthood under such a corrupt system, and he became a prophet. That is the picture. He was a priest. He became a prophet. Now, John the Baptist is one of those striking characters who appear from time to time. He reminded the people of someone who'd gone before because of a certain similarity in his methods. They thought he was Elijah. He was so different that he also reminded folk of no one who had appeared, but of a great one to appear, the Messiah. John the Baptist is a paradoxical person. And here in Southern California, where we use the word unusual very glibly, even in referring to the weather, I don't care what kind of weather we have, it's called unusual, the word's lost the sharpness of its meaning. But John the Baptist was truly an unusual man. Luke told us, that he had a miraculous birth. We've seen that. was attended by a visitation from the angel, from Gabriel. His entire boyhood's passed over here. And the next event in his life, which Luke records, is here in this chapter 3, beginning of his ministry, and that occupies our attention. He was a priest, a prophet, and a preacher. By birth he was a priest, the son of Zechariah. But he was also by call by the choice of God. He was a prophet of God. And the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, that we are told. And he came into all the country about Jordan, verse 3, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He was preaching the baptism of repentance. He's the last of the prophets. He's actually an Old Testament character who walks out on the page of the New Testament. He's picturesque. My, to see it. He was unshaven, shaggy, wore camel's hair. His dress, his diet, his looks, all was different. And he received the same reception that all prophets received. He was put to death. You know, the most unwelcome message, even today, is the voice of the prophet. The world will not have a man contradict its philosophy of life. Friends, if you're going to be popular today, and this is true of preachers, you've got to sing in unison with the crowd. 
And God have mercy today on the pulpit where it's nothing in the world but a sounding board for what the congregation is saying. God have mercy on that preacher. The world does not want to hear the voice of God, especially when that voice speaks of judgment. This man John was pretty strong in his message, by the way. He says, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. He came, you see, to fulfill prophecy. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude, now here's the message of John, he came forth to be baptized of him. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I wonder how long a preacher would last in any church if he got up next Sunday morning and said, began by saying, O generation of vipers. I want to say to you, I don't think he'd be in the pulpit the next Sunday. I think the people would get rid of him. John the Baptist, he sure had an unusual introduction for a sermon, but I don't recommend it. I have taught homiletics in seminaries and a couple, and I have told a young man, I said, never begin a sermon like John the Baptist did, because you won't last very long as a preacher. And I'm not sure that God wants us to use this same language today, but I do think it would be appropriate in many churches today. Oh, generation of vipers! That's a strange way to begin a sermon, is it not? Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he says, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God's able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, his message was a message of repentance. And somebody says, well, is that the message we give today? No, actually, it's not. Somebody says, well, isn't repentance in our message today? Yes, I think the repentance is in faith today. Paul said to the Thessalonians, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And you can't turn to God without turning from something. When you turn to anything, you turn from something. Couldn't be otherwise. And that turning from something, that's repentance. And I think the world needs to repent. Somebody says, before it can accept the gift of eternal life. Well, may I say to you, you need to accept eternal life, and when you do, you're going to turn from the things of the world. Perhaps someone's listening today. You've heard the love of God, and you haven't been moved by it, and you've wondered why. May I say to you, you need to hear the voice crying in the wilderness, repent. Repentance is in saving faith. And my friend today... May I say this to you? This is not the message of the hour. I grant that. We preach the grace of God. But I want to say this to you. If you have been a recipient of the grace of God, and if you turn to God, you're going to have to turn from your sin. And if you don't turn from your sin, you haven't turned to God. Repentance is there, my friend. But the message is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now in the ninth verse of this third chapter of Luke, and it's the message of John the Baptist, and he goes on to tell these people, Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And believe me, friends, that's a tough message. Somebody said he never brought the message of the redeeming love of God, did he? No, he didn't. He wasn't called to give that message, by the way. He was harsh, but not too harsh. Somebody says, but this is not for us today. I think so. I think a little of this will go a long ways. We hear a great deal about the Christians being the salt of the earth. Well, I think maybe there ought to be a little salt and pepper of the earth, too, but not too much pepper. We need to recognize that this is one of the facets of the message from God today. And it's strong, I grant you. And he's saying to these people that if they don't bring forth fruit, the axe will be put to the root of the tree. I think our Lord's saying that to the church today. 
And the people ask him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. He that hath meat, let him do likewise. In other words, the thing they were living for self and not attempting to share with others. Then came the publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. The publicans, you see, turned to John. They also turned to the Lord. And his soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, be content with your wages. This is a practical message he gave to all these different classes and conditions. My friend, today, if you are a printer, you reveal that you're a Christian by the way you print. If you today are a soldier, you reveal your Christianity by the way you soldier. If you're a housewife, you reveal your Christianity by the way you're a housewife. I don't care what you are, you reveal it, because by their fruits you shall know them. John, though, makes it clear his message was not final. John answered in verse 16, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, I've dealt with that before when we had it in Matthew, and I'll pass over this now. And we find that John also got in trouble with Herod because we read, but Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Now, we find here in verse 21, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And you see, Luke, as also Matthew, does not attempt to give us a chronological order. If he had, he'd put the baptism before this incident of John. And Matthew attempts to record what happened after it happened in order to explain why John the Baptist was put to death. You see, all of this fits into the package that we have here. And we need to keep that in mind. No writer's attempting to give you a chronological order. Now we have something here that's quite interesting. Verse 22, "...and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased." And what we have here is a revelation of the Trinity. We have the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus... And Jesus is a member of the Trinity, and the voice from heaven is the voice of the Father. You have the Trinity here. Then we have given here, in the rest of this chapter, the genealogy of Mary, not the genealogy of Joseph. That is over in Matthew. But you see, Luke gives us Mary's story, and this is her genealogy. And it's a little different, by the way, than the genealogies that have been given here to four. For instance, you have the genealogy in Matthew, so-and-so begets so-and-so, and so-and-so begets so-and-so. But this begins with actually the father of Mary and goes right back to Adam. And the genealogy begins with Abraham and Matthew and comes down to Jesus. It goes through Joseph there, and here it goes through Mary. And this is Mary's genealogy, and she came in the line of David also. You see, Matthew, the royal line, comes down from David. And it's given the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Then he comes down to Jesus through Joseph, and he gets the royal line. The legal title to the throne came through Joseph. But wait just a moment. Luke gives the bloodline, and that must go back to David. And so it's given in that order, actually given in a reverse order, if you'll notice that. And that, again, is very important to see. And I would just call attention to one or two things when it says that 
so-and-so is the son of Joseph, as was supposed. That is a very clear-cut statement. Dr. Luke makes it clear Joseph was not the father. But when it says, which was the son of Mathat, was Joseph the son of Mathat? No, he was not. Or the son of Eli? No, he was not. The word son is not actually in the better manuscripts. It's been added here, and I think rightly so, that if we'll properly understand that he was the head of the house, and that line will be carried by the father, by the man, and not by the woman. In other words, it's the man's genealogy that's generally followed. Now somebody says, can you be sure that this is a different genealogy? Oh, yes. If you go to verse 31, you will find here, it reads like this which was the son of Malia, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Now, you see, Matthew, it's David through Solomon. Here, it's David through Nathan, another son of David. And Mary was in the royal line. So she had the blood of David in her veins. And from that line, the Lord Jesus got that title. And this also reveals him as the son of man, the savior of the world, because it doesn't stop with Abraham. It goes all the way back to Adam, which was the son of God. He was created the son of God, and he fell from that lofty position. And the son of God has come to bring mankind back into that relationship with God through faith in Christ. Now you have the testing of the Lord Jesus. We call it the temptation, and you'll see why in a moment, why I call it the testing of the Lord Jesus. Now I want you to notice this in particular, because this is very important to see. We have here Jesus being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Now, if you'll notice that the synoptic gospels record the temptation. And when I say synoptic, I mean Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're written from the same viewpoint. But John does not record the temptation. He is presenting the Lord Jesus as the Son of God, and the emphasis is upon the deity. Now, the synoptic gospels place the emphasis upon his humanity. He was tempted as a man. And friends, as God, he cannot be tempted. You will notice that he is the son of man in the gospel of Luke. That's what the last verse said of chapter 3. He's the son of Enos, which is the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Son of Adam takes him right back to where we're all a member. Now, he was in all points, therefore tempted like as we are, yet without sin. There is a frightful and fearful darkness about the temptation of our Lord that's an appalling enigma. And I must confess, I can't explain it, but I'll take you to the very edge and there at the fringe. I hope we can learn something. There were unseen and hidden forces of evil, and he was surrounded by powers of darkness and destruction. He grappled with basic problems of mankind, that which is earthy, and he won a victory for mankind. He won a victory for me. Now, there are several preliminary considerations that we need to look at here. We are told he was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Son of God as man needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit to meet the temptation. And friends, I cannot face the temptations of this world. I can't do it in my own strength. Paul said, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. That's Romans 7, 21. Haven't you found that to be true? Paul says again in Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, the flesh is weak, not the law. God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, 
but after the Spirit. And then again, in Galatians 5, 16, Paul said, "...this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh." And Deuteronomy 8, 2 said, "...and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness." to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou shouldst keep his commandments or no. In other words, God was testing them. And God never tests anyone with evil, you see. Now, we are told, therefore, that he was tested, and our Lord was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Mark says, immediately the Holy Spirit driveth him. In other words, our Lord did not seek the temptation. And he could pray even at the Garden of Gethsemane, let this cup pass. These people today that more or less pride themselves lying on a board filled with nails. And a lot of Christians do that today. They sort of magnify their troubles. We do not need to do that. Now, the temptation did not begin at the end of the 40 days. What he's saying here is, when they were ended, he afterward hungered. That is, being forty days tempted of the devil, all during those forty days, and all his life. And it didn't end in the wilderness, because the Garden of Gethsemane was another onslaught of Satan. And verse 13 here says, "...when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season." Now, that's something that we need to notice in particular. Another thing is, is the devil a person? Well, I understand that 30% to 90% of ministers today say, no, I believe the devil is a person. The Scripture makes it clear. Did he come in bodily form? Did he come in a spirit? Or did he come as an angel of light? Well, it says our Lord met him face to face. The subtlety of Satan. One time he's a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The next time he's an angel of light, deceiving even those If they were not the elect, they'd be deceived. And the test here is quite interesting. What does it mean when it says he was tempted? Well, it has a twofold meaning. To tempt means inciting and enticing to evil. It means to seduce. And that always rests upon the fact that there's something in the individual that causes him to yield. You see, it wouldn't be a temptation in that sense, unless there was something in the individual. But that wasn't true of Christ. He could say, the prince of this world cometh, he finds nothing in me. I don't know about you, friends, but every time he comes to me, he always finds some place to take hold of. Our Lord was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. And then it's used in another way. It's used in the Old Testament. God did tempt Abraham. Now, he tested Abraham. And the passage I read in Deuteronomy where God said for 40 years, I tempted you in the wilderness. What he means is I proved you in the wilderness. I tested you. Now, that raises a question, and will you listen to me now very carefully? Could Christ have fallen? Listen to me. The answer is no. Then was it a legitimate temptation? It was a test, my friend. New articles are all tested, all tires Everlastingly on the television, they're showing you the new model automobile, and they drive it through purgatory to show you that the thing will take it. Everything is tested. Not to break it down, it would be pretty embarrassing for the General Motor Company and also for Ford Motor Company and the others if their car broke down in a test. The Lord Jesus could not have fallen. And somebody says, well, then how could it be a test? Let me illustrate it with a very simple story that I've told many times. When I was a boy in West Texas, we lived on the West Fork of the Brazos. And in summertime, friends, there wasn't enough water in the Brazos to make a shingle nail rust. It was dry. But in wintertime, you could have floated a battleship down it. And one year we had a flood, and it washed out the railroad bridge that was over the Brazos. And we live right near it because the little town was right there on the Brazos. And the thing that happened was that the railroad came in immediately, the Santa Fe did, put in a new bridge. And when they got it finished, they brought two engines out, put them on top of the bridge, 
and then they tied the whistle down. We'd never heard two engines whistle at the same time. And all of us in that little town went down to the bridge. All 27 of us went down. And friends, when we got down there, we were curious, a lot of country folk. And one brave fellow in the crowd said, what are you doing? The engineer said, we're testing the bridge. He said, do you think it'll break? And the engineer, with almost a snare, says, of course it won't break. Well, why are you putting the engines on there? He says, just to prove that it won't break. That's what the temptation of the Lord Jesus is to show that you and I got a Savior, friends, that's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God from him. Now, he was tested in a way you and I have never been tested, and in a way that I think is tremendous. You see, when you and I are tested, there's always a breaking point. And when we reach that breaking point, we break, and then the pressure is removed. It was never removed from him. And you have a threefold test here. It was physical, as you know, and it was psychological of the mind, and it was spiritual. Let me just lift out these verses. Physical, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone, that it be made bread. And bread's a staff of life. It's a necessity. Didn't ask him to commit a crime. He fed 5,000 one time, 4,000 on another. Well, Eve had seen the tree was good for food. She ate it. What's wrong with this? Well, a man must live, you know. You've got to eat to live. That's the philosophy of a great many today. The clamor of the crowd, the medley of the mob. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? And wherewithal shall we be clothed? And that's just about life today for most people. Men will become dishonest, steal, gamble, sell liquor, do anything. Well, in order to get something for the body, women will sell their virtue for a mink coat and a diamond ring. And this is Satan's low estimate of man. Man is physical, an animal on that side. And he told Job, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And... That's not true. Here's a man that didn't yield. And our Lord used the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God here. And he said to him, Jesus said, It's written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then there was the psychological test, verse 5. And the devil taketh him to a high mountain, showing him the kingdoms of the world, the lust of the eyes. Eve saw it was pleasant to the eyes, the world inhabited the Roman Empire then, but Christ was on the way to the throne by way of a cross. And Satan said, let's miss the cross. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I want to say something pretty strong now. It's satanic today to try to build a kingdom here on this earth without Jesus Christ, because there's only two rulers. That's the Lord Jesus and Satan. And if you are not taking him into account, you must be taking the other. Then there's the spiritual temptation. Verse 9, he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thou thyself down from thence. And Eve desired the tree because it's to be made one wise. That's the realm of the Spirit, that of faith, you see. And Satan quoted Scripture also, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He'll give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. But he didn't give all the quotation, you see. Why was Jesus tested? To demonstrate that I have a sinless Savior, that he's impeccable, that he's able to save, and that all power is given to him. And there's a man in the glory today, friends, who is there for you and me, and he sympathizes with us, and he understands us today. And it's wonderful to have a Savior like that. My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It's wonderful to have a Savior up there today who is a Savior, friends, and one you can depend upon how wonderful he is. 
Now, after the testing, he needed strengthening. And verse 14 tells about that. And Jesus returned, that is, from the testing, in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now, as we've said, after the temptation, he was strengthened. Temptation will do one of two things for an individual today. It'll either strengthen you or weaken you. Someone has said about the army, you know, the army either will make you or break you, either make a man or break a man. Well, that may or may not be true. I do not know. But I do know this suffering, for instance, and testing will either sweeten you or sour you, soften you or harden you. And it's not that God's going to harden you. He never hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh had that kind of heart, and the only thing God did was just bring it out. Now, our Lord so identified himself with mankind, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. So he needed strengthening. Now, we notice here that when he came into his home area, that he taught in the synagogues, being glorified of all. He was praised and complimented. And it sounds like a doxology here. You know, it's possible to praise him and still reject him. It's possible to sing the doxology and then to turn down his claims. The same crowd that sang Hosanna that was wanting to crown him, one day, the next day, they joined with the mob to crucify him. The picture of the crucifixion by Tintoretta in Venice, it shows a donkey in the background feeding on withered palm branches, and then it shows the empty cross. That's the way it was. One day he comes in in his praise, the next day they crucify him. Now that brings us here to one of the most beautiful incidents. It's a scintillating story. It's flashing with light. It's fragrant with meaning, and it's lovely to look at. And I'm going to let Luke tell this to us. I'm going to begin reading at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, this is an incident that only Dr. Luke records. And it's a remarkable incident, by the way, so remarkable that we can't pass it by here without saying something about it. Now, we are told here that he came back to his hometown. And generally, the hometown is proud of the local boy. Nazareth was his hometown. And we're told, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He never entertained the false notion that you can worship God in nature as well as in the appointed place. Now, I enjoy playing golf, but I get a little weary of hearing some man say very piously, I can worship God just as easy on the golf course on Sunday as I can in church. And you know what the answer to that is? The answer is, you can. But the question I always put to a man that says that to me is, well, when you go out to the golf course and take your golf bag on Sunday morning, do you go out to worship or to play golf? And, you know, invariably they begin to hum and haw. 
And I said, now, don't kid me. You go out to play golf, don't you? You really don't go out to worship God. And the fact of the matter is you don't worship God. Now, I said, frankly, I think there's something wrong with any person that gets a golf bag, goes out on a golf course, and says, I'm out here to worship God. I think a man like that, you ought to call the wagon with the man with the little white coat to come and get him and take him away. Now, I, frankly, I go to church on Sunday to worship God. I go out on the golf course on Monday morning to play golf, and I don't go out there to worship God. Now, many times I've had to stop and do stop and just look around at the glorious scenery, and I just thank God for the privilege of being there. But my friend, I go out there to play golf. Something wrong with you if you do it any other way than that. The custom of our Lord was to go into the synagogue. Now, just a moment. Did you notice where he went? The synagogue. The synagogue grew up during or after the Babylonian captivity. And by the time of our Lord, it had degenerated into that which was not in the purpose of God at all. If there had been an evangelical place to worship God, I think he would have gone there. But he attended that which was in existence in his day, and it was far from God. And I do not know whether... Some brethren today would have said to him, Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. He went to the synagogue, and that's the only comment that I can make. I say to stay where you can bear a testimony for God. And if you can't bear a testimony for God, then get out of the place. There are too many folk today, though, that are just hanging on, and they know they don't have a testimony they're staying in a liberal church because Grandpa happened to be the man who built the place or he gave the land or he was the head deacon or he was the pastor of the church. Well, my friend, if that place is departed from the faith, you have no business being there. But if you've got a witness, then hang around because we ought to be around where we can give a witness today. Now, will you notice, as is custom, he attended regularly. I can now fill in one day of the silent years, one day of seven, I should say. Every seventh day, he went to the synagogue, the silent years. Now, I don't know too much about the other six days. He was a carpenter, and he worked those days. But he went to the appointed place of worship because he could witness there. Now, there was handed to him the book, and he read in it. And what book did he read in? Well, he read in Isaiah. What chapter did he read? Well, he didn't read in any chapter because the Bible wasn't divided into chapters and verses in that day. But in my Bible, it happened to be chapter 61 of Isaiah, verse 1. If you have your Bible there, stay with Luke, the fourth chapter, and watch, beginning with verse 18, and I'll read what Isaiah said. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort them that mourn, and to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, etc., and etc. And I'll not read any more, because the point I want to make is right here. Do you notice where he broke off the reading? It says, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book and gave it again to the minister. Well, when you go back and read that, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, he didn't even stop at the end of a sentence. He stopped at the end of a comma. There wasn't even a comma in that day. He didn't mention the next, the day of vengeance of our God and what is to follow after that. You know why? Because he looked at that crowd and said, This day is this Scripture fulfilled in your ears. In other words, here is a passage of Scripture that was going to be fulfilled down to a comma. And the other part won't be fulfilled till he comes back the second time. Here is his interpretation of Scripture. I like his lots better than I like some of the modern commentators, by the way. 
this was fulfilled up to this. The day of vengeance has not come. The time when he said, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. How is he going to get them? Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. That's the way he's come into power. That's the day of vengeance. That's the great day of the Lord. That will take place when he comes the second time. We're living in this wonderful day when he was anointed of the Spirit to preach the gospel to the poor. And what was that? That poor sinners might be saved today. That's the glorious message that he came to give. Now we read, "...and all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And that seemed to spoil it all. You see, he's a carpenter. How could he be the Messiah? Well, Luke's making it very clear that he took upon himself our frail humanity. Now, will you notice, he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Zidon unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. This is a marvelous thing that he did. He took two Gentiles. This woman of Sarepta lived outside of the land. Naaman was a captain in the army of the king of Syria, and he was healed. The very wonderful thing is this, that these people were apt to miss a great blessing because they would not accept who he was. And they would be like the many widows in that day that their son died and they lost him. And they'd be like many lepers in that day that were not healed. And all day in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. You see, his hometown rejected him. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city led him to the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. And that's rough country, by the way, around Nazareth. They intended to kill him, you can see. They were going to get rid of him. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. And that, I consider, is a miracle, his escape from this mob, because the mob intended to get rid of him. Now we are told, and he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And you have now, as we've seen before in both Matthew and Mark, that the Lord Jesus moved his headquarters all the way from his hometown of Nazareth down to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. Oh, that's not too many miles, and yet in that day when most people walked, it would be quite a distance, but he shifted his headquarters because his hometown would not receive him at all. That is the picture that's given to us here. Now, we have here in Capernaum the same thing we had in both Matthew and especially in Mark. And what we have is one day that's spent with Jesus, and that you have in the rest of this chapter. And there are many of us that would love to have spent a day with him when he was here on earth during his earthly ministry. Well, Luke makes that possible for you. He gives us the happenings of one day. It's a busy day. It was a Sabbath day. Mark gave this to us, and I went into detail there. I'll not go into too much detail here. And he was in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. He had to leave. They rejected him. They would have gotten rid of him. And he goes to Capernaum now. He makes this his headquarters. And there did come a day when he says, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, will be cast down to hell because of the fact they had seen his mighty works. Well, now notice, in the morning he goes to the synagogue. 
And we're told that he taught them on the Sabbath days, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for the word was with power. Our Lord didn't speak as a scribe or a Pharisee, but one that had authority. Now, we have looked at that before. The thing that he did, there was the spirit of the unclean demon. And I'm going to have occasion in the Gospel of Luke to speak a little bit more in detail about demonism than I have before. We'll see that later on. I've gone into this when we were in the Gospel of Mark, but I intend to go into more detail. The reason is that you and I today are living in the day when demonism has lifted its ugly head again, and Satan worship today is a reality. And we have around us today the appearance of demonism. I believe it's a reality, and I believe that there is the working of demons today. Now, our Lord cast the demon out of this individual. And by the way, it'd be pretty difficult to explain the action of some folk today, even under drugs, some of the crimes, some of the awful things they're doing, seems unbelievable. And the only explanation I think that you can find is that They're under the power and control of Satan. Then we find that the Lord Jesus in the morning went into the synagogue. He taught, and there was the spirit of the unclean demon he cast out. Now, in the afternoon, he went over, I guess, for the noonday meal at the home of Simon Peter. We've seen that before. And while he was there, why, he healed Simon Peter's wife's mother. And my mother-in-law always called my attention to this. She said that the Scripture doesn't call her a mother-in-law, but it's always Simon's wife's mother. And I would always answer her by saying, well, that's a mother-in-law. And so that is exactly what you have here, a mother-in-law. And you could make a lot of stories about mother-in-laws. There are a lot of jokes about them, but the Scripture, for some reason, there's a lot of humor in the Bible, but there's none about mother-in-laws. Our Lord healed Simon Peter's wife's mother. He healed her. And it was a Sabbath day. And they would object to that, of course, but that he did. And you find out also that when he went into the home of Simon, why, he went there for dinner. And this woman had a great fever. The diseases were classified then as little and great fever. She apparently had a disease, something like typhoid. And he stood over her, and using medical terminology again, he used the term be muzzled. That's the way Dr. Luke tells it, you see. And like wild dogs which have broken the leash, and that's what had happened. Our Lord took sin and dealt with it just like that. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. You see, when Christ healed, it was not necessary to lead them off the platform. didn't come about gradually. It took place immediately. That's the very um, amazing thing. I heard the record of a faith healer not long ago that someone attended the service and said a cripple was led up there, and the cripple was led off. But somebody came on. They said they had an internal cancer. They were healed immediately of that. May I say to you, it's amazing how... People will accept that type of thing. Why didn't the man who's crippled, why didn't he walk off without any problem at all, no limp? But if our Lord did it, that's what would happen, my friend. Now, somebody says, well, don't you believe in divine healing? And my question is, what other kind is there? All healing is divine. And that's what Luke's telling us. Doctors do not always recognize that. I had a wonderful doctor who was a member of my church in Texas, and he said to me, he says, I send the bill, but God does the healing. I can merely take out that part that's offending the body, but God will have to do the healing. What a wonderful testimony that is. And it's a great testimony. It's not your faith that would heal you anyway. It's not of an individual. It's God. And God uses an instrumentality. And sometimes he does not. His instrumentality today could be a doctor. And now it was evening, late at night, and he went out from one to another, and he touched them. You know, Matthew, in recording this incident, quotes Isaiah. 
And I'm not going back over that, but you'll notice that our Lord here is healing in a very wonderful way. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He bore the sicknesses and diseases sympathetically. In spite of that, the nation Israel in that day esteemed him stricken. That is the way we esteem him. He did not heal them on the basis of faith as far as we know. His great heart of sympathy is what caused him to move in their behalf. And that's what we're told today, bear ye one another's burdens. Now, you'll notice that he was here and he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. That's verse 44. He's bringing the gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand in the presence and person of the king who is there. Now, that brings us to the end of chapter 4, and next time we'll pick up with chapter 5 of the gospel of Luke, and I trust you'll be with us.